Over the past two decades, we've read many different books and series all set in Elan with different characters and villains and storylines. But as time has progressed, we've learned that behind every short story and book and series, there is an underlying plot that underpins the very fabric of Elan. And at the center of that story are two characters, Trilos and Turin. So today, we are going to dig into two of the most fascinating characters on Elan, talk about the events that led to their feud, and point out all the times they've been controlling events from the shadows. Before we get started, quick spoiler warning that we will be giving spoilers for almost all of the Elan series, including the most recent book, Ezra Hodden. Now, since many of the events that we're going to talk about aren't things that actually happened in the books, and because Sullivan is known for writing characters as unreliable narrators, I needed a way to convey our surety about what actually happened. So I came up with this scale. A green dragon means we saw this event happen in a book, so we are 100% sure it happened and know how it happened. A yellow dragon means we didn't see it happen, but the event has been confirmed by a reliable source, or multiple sources, so we are quite sure it happened even if the details are not 100% known. And finally, an orange dragon means we're still pretty sure it happened, but the time frame and details are fuzzy. I will also try to include an approximate date for when the events occurred if I can. Enough of an intro though. Let's begin with how it all started. And for this story, we need to go back to the very beginning, before the world even existed, when there was only chaos. Out of that chaos came Eaton, the infinite sky, and Elon, the finite planet. Together, they would create Aluria, who was the mother of all life, who often took the form of an immense tree. Next, they made the triplets Earl, Toth, and Gar, three entities who are more forces of nature than physical beings, who would be known as the Typhons. After making their destructive natures known, the Typhons would be banished by Eaton to the Abyss, the lowest section of Pyre, deep within the bowels of Elan. Eaton no longer wanted to create any more beings, but Elan, against the wishes of Eaton, would create five more, known as the Aesira. The eldest was Turin. Turin was followed by his brother Trilos, then the twins, Drome and Feral, and finally the youngest, Mari. Eaton agreed that the Aesira could continue to live, but that they would be mortal, someday dying and their souls going to Pyre. And so, from Aluria and the Aesira, life would truly begin to flourish on Elan. Over the next several thousands of years, in the city of Erebus, the inhabitants of the young world would live in bliss. The Aesira, who had the power of foresight, the ability to see the future, would lead the peoples of the world, and Turin, being the eldest, would form a special bond with Aluria, and they would have a daughter named Muriel. Because of their bond, Turin would tell Eluria how scared he was to die someday, and so Eluria gave him one of her fruit, which could grant him immortality if he chose to eat it. And while things seemed perfect on Elan, Chaos, the power from which Eaton and Elan originally came, was still trying to destroy this new reality which had been created, though Eaton did do his best to turn it away. And this is where things start to take a turn for the worst. We are not exactly sure why, but at some point, Turin was either nearing the end of his life or he was infected by chaos, and he would end up eating a second, different fruit from Meloria, granting him immortality. On top of that immortality, the power of the fruit also greatly increased his power of foresight. And whether it was because of his new circumstances or because he was infected by chaos, he would grow more and more arrogant. He would proclaim himself king of the world. 
he would then find out that his daughter Muriel and brother Trilos had fallen in love. Due to his jealousy, he hated this and would go on to kill Trilos, who would become the first mortal to have their body die and soul go to Pyre, where only the Typhons were at this point. To make matters worse, Torin would then immediately take the original fruit of Aloria he had been given and go to Muriel and trick her into eating it, making Muriel immortal, giving her foresight, and making her unable to ever go to Pyre, forever separating her and Trilos. After word spread about the world's first death and murder, Turin's remaining three siblings, Feral, Drome, and Mari, would all turn their backs on him, each taking their followers and leaving Erebus to go build their own respective cities. Turin, who is now going by the name Rex Uberlin, would not stand for his siblings' disrespect. One by one, he went to their cities and murdered them in what would become the first great war. As the war was raging, Eaton decided to banish Aluria to the Sacred Grove, a place in which she would be cut off from his light. Whether this was due to her insubordination in giving Torin her fruit, or whether it was to quarantine her due to her being infected by chaos, which was still trying to seep into the world, is unclear. The minute Aluria died, the world turned from a green summer day to the bitter cold of winter. Turin felt it, and he would immediately abandon his war and his followers and go to the Sacred Grove, the isolated place where Aluria's now dead husk resided. Upon arriving at the Sacred Grove and finding Aluria's body, Turin went mad with rage. He would attempt to battle against his father, the sky. But Eaton is eternal. Slowly, Turin would soften and tire, eventually wishing for his own death. But even that, Eaton would not grant. At this point, Elan would step in on behalf of her son and not allow Eaton to send him to Pyre, where all the casualties of his war resided. Turin would stay in the Sacred Grove for quite a bit of time, weeping. On Elan, the war had continued. Erebus was besieged and would eventually fall. And while the followers of Turin had been winning, their infighting would allow the tides to shift, and they would eventually be pushed back to Arencia. Before falling, three of Turin's five generals, called the Riva, would create a massive weave of magic that sundered the planet consuming themselves in the process. At which point, the followers of Feral, the Frey, Drome, the Dwarves, and Mari, the Humans, would begin their migrations across the face of Elan. Back in the Sacred Grove, Elan and Turin spoke. Turin realized that because of the immense wickedness of his actions, that he had broken the world. But Elan told him that just as he had become evil, he could unbecome it, and that it would be his job to fix the world that he had broken. Turin decided to take up this charge. Before he left the grove, Elan would give him the key of Eaton, an artifact that would allow the bearer to open the doors between the living world of Elan and Pyre, the world of the dead, as well as the sacred grove. Back in Pyre, Trilos, who is still in the upper sections above the abyss, met other casualties of the war as they arrived, including his siblings. Through them, he learned that Muriel had gained immortality, meaning she would never be joining him, and he threw himself down into the abyss where only the Typhons dwelt. Back on Elan, Turin emerged from the sacred grove, locking it behind him, and started to get to work. He took his magic robe and encased it in stone with instructions meant for a gazelle priestess named Hecuba thousands of years in the future. He then took the name of Caraticus and went to the assistance of the fray as he felt he had wronged his sister Feral the worse. He specifically went to a fray named Glendora and led her to the sacred grove. Together, they would unite the fray peoples building the city of Estremnodon 
and creating the Horn of Glendora and Pharaoh's Law, a magical system of governance which stopped internal conflicts as any Frey who killed another Frey would have their soul barred from Pyre. At the same time, Maleva, one of the two remaining Rivas, wanted information on Muriel as she wanted to kill her. She realized that if she could free Trilos, she could use him to gain this information. So she decided to make a deal with the Typhons, which wasn't that easy as they were in the Abyss and she was still on Elan. Maleva would kill her victims and force them to take messages down into the Abyss. In this deal, the Typhons would help Trilos escape, and in return, she would start digging down towards the Typhons to try and release them. The Typhons did their best to uphold their end of the bargain, and in the Abyss, they carved out a cave, which would later be called the Agave. This cave went all the way up to the membrane that separated Pyre from the living world. In Elan, this came up to a spot deep beneath Dome Mountain, where Neath, the capital of the dwarves, had been established. But even the Typhons could not break through the barrier. Trilos went up to the membrane and came up with a plan. If he could gain enough power to cast a weave on his side, as well as get assistance from the dwarves on the other side, then he could poke a pin-sized hole through the membrane through which his soul could escape. But this ended up taking quite a while, as the dwarves he was able to contact and communicate with wanted something in return for their help. Trilos offered to teach them the secrets of copper, bronze, and iron, but each time he gave them knowledge of how to create the new metals, they would come back and say it was not enough. So finally, Trilos offered them immortality in the form of the knowledge of the fruit of Aluria. This finally was enough to gain the dwarven help. Trilos still needed the power from his side though, which came in the form of him making an extreme sacrifice. But he was still all alone, so all he could do was sacrifice his memories of Muriel, forever severing his ties to the love of his life. Afraid of losing this knowledge forever though, he would carve out his story onto the tablets in the Agave, using a language that would not be invented until several thousand years later. Once he was done, the time finally came, and Trilo sacrificed his memories, and his soul escaped from the Abyss. During these events, he was still angry with the dwarves for their actions while bartering with him, and so he created a giant, demon-like magical being which would kill many dwarves and drive them from their capital city. At that point, Trilos was now back in the world of the living, but Turin, who had nearly peerless foresight, did not know that. This was due to the fact that Turin was immortal, and therefore he couldn't see into Pyre, and he couldn't see the actions of someone who was already dead. Neither Trilos nor Turin realized this though. Back with the dwarves, they now believed that the sacred grove located in Estremnadon, the capital city of the Frey, housed a tree whose fruit could bestow immortality. The leader of the dwarves, King Midian, demanded the fruit from the Frey, but that was not something that the Frey could give as they couldn't enter the sacred grove, and even if they could, all they would find was Aluria's dead husk. This would begin a war between the two races, named the Belgric War. Trilos would begin to travel to Estremnadon, but he would stop off at Brapathen to meet with Maleva, who had helped him escape. He was not much help to her though, as the information she wanted was about the very thing he had sacrificed to escape, Muriel. Trilos continued on and arrived at Estremnadon as the Frey were losing the war badly. As Trilos still had a grudge against the dwarves, he decided to teach one of the Frey, Fenelius Mira, magic, which they called the art, turning her into one of the most powerful artists to ever live. Fenelius would single-handedly turn the tide of war, destroying legions of dwarves herself, going on the offensive. By this time, 
Turin would have noticed that something was very wrong, as he wouldn't have been able to foresee the war or Fenelace's sudden command of the art because both were caused by Trilos. He taught the dwarves the Orinfar, which was a written version of the art that can protect against the art. This would be enough to give the dwarves some protection against Fenelaeus, but that gift itself would not be anywhere near enough as Fenelaeus would push the dwarves back past Neath and all the way to Drumendor, where it looked like the dwarves would be completely wiped out. Turin again stepped in and would take Fenelaeus from the front lines all the way back to Estremnadon, where, using Eaton's key, he would take her into the sacred grove and show her Alluria's body, illustrating the cost of war and revenge. This act would turn Fenelaeus' heart, and she would end the Belgric War. This would be the first of many times that Turin would need to stop events put in motion by Trilos. Trilos, still not knowing about Turin's change of heart, was confused by the end of the war. He knew someone must have changed Fenelaeus' mind. He named that entity the Invisible Hand and would start his work toward finding it. Trilos would stay in Estremnadon and would spend his time watching the door, which he had missed opening, and teaching the fray in their newly acquired skill with the art. He had several students, including a fray named Grendel. Turin would busy himself guiding events towards his goal of fixing the world. Some of that included becoming the father of the mystic Tura, setting Tura on her path to find and raise the human, Suri. After he left Tura, he would become a supposed slave named Malcolm to Zephron, the leader of the Instaria tribe of the Frey. These actions would set in motion the events that would find Zephron dead at the hands of Fain Lothian, at which point Turin's slavery would pass to Zephron's son, Nephron, which at long last brings us to our first book set in Elan, the Legends of the First Empire series. Turin would start the series by orchestrating the fray Shagan's death at the hands of the human Wraith setting Wraith along his path. Turin would then travel with Wraith to Dal Ren to help influence the rest of the humans. Trilos, who is still in Estremnadon, would do his part in sowing chaos by sending Grendel to Dal Ren to, as he put it, start the boulder in motion. After that, Trilos doesn't interfere much, instead choosing to wait to see what happens. Turin, on the other hand, would constantly be poking and prodding the humans and Instaria, helping them in their new war, which was all part of his plan. During this time, some of the humans, including Bryn, traveled to Neath, looking for help in gaining weapons. There, under the mountain, they would find the Agave and the tablets Trilos had written. They would also destroy the creature Trilos had created, when they later left, having completed their quest, they would take knowledge of the Agave with them. About two years later, when the war was well and truly underway, Bryn would talk with Turin, who she still only knew as Malcolm, and she would tell him about the Agave and what they had found there. This surprised Turin, but it helped him explain many things, mainly who was causing all the chaos that he couldn't foresee. Turin decided he needed to look into this more closely, so he chose to leave the humans for a time. But first, he would set in motion his plans to send a group of humans through the underworld to retrieve the Horn of Glendora to stop the war, but also to show the humans, mainly Bryn, how the world came to be in its current state. Turin then left and traveled down to Neath to find the Agave for himself. The Agave had completely been cut off due to a cave-in, so we are not sure if he was able to access it, though he was extremely powerful, so he very well could have. Turin then traveled to Barapathen to meet with Maleva to see what she knew about Trilos. We do not know how that conversation transpired. 
Five years later, Turin returned to the human war encampment, arriving just after the human party, including Bryn, entered Pyre, trying to reach the sacred grove and Estremnadon. Bryn would make it all the way through Pyre and open the door on the other side. While Bryn was getting the horn of Glendora from Suri, Trilos was finally able to enter the sacred grove and see the remains of Aluria for himself. When Bryn returned, Trilos demanded the key of Eton, but Bryn did not give it to him and returned through Pyre. Once back with the humans, Turin told Bryn she must quickly write down her whole story. The night before the final duel between Nephron and Mwandalay, which would decide the fate of the human and Frey war, Turin gave Nephron his final advice and then disappeared. On the day of the duel, Trilo showed up and took the book Bryn had written, the very one that contained his own words about Muriel, which Bryn had read on the Agave tablets. Turin had planned to use Bryn's book to teach the world the truth, but Trilos ended those plans with his theft. Once the duel was complete and Nephron and the humans had won, Trilos took Mwandalay as he planned to use him in his future plans to sow chaos. Then, 17 years later, Turin would go to Persephone's deathbed to give her reassurance. This is something Turin actually did with multiple characters throughout the series as he often felt guilty for how he had to use them in order for his plans to come to fruition. Turin then traveled to the Swamp of Ith, where Muriel now lived. Turin had not seen his daughter in a very, very long time as she still hated him for what he had done to her. Muriel still had Eaton's key, which had ended up with her after Bryn and the humans returned from Pyre. She offered the key back to Turin, but he told her to keep it, which she found odd, leaving something so powerful in the hands of someone who hated him so much. He told her to use it again once she had forgiven him, which she laughed at, saying she would never forgive him. He explained how he had changed and how he was trying to fix the world. She gave him a sack and told him she would send him a feather whenever he did something to make her hatred of him lessen. As he left, he received his first feather. Now that the Empire had been established, Trilos traveled with Mondalay. Trilos would not read Bryn's book though, as he was too afraid of what he might find. The pair would go to Barapathin for a time, where Trilos would meet a human named Bran, and would finally gain the courage to read the book. Doing so fueled Trilos' rage at his brother for what he had done. Trilos would eventually leave Barapathin with Mwandalay, going places such as Marinonia, and eventually the Empire's capital city, Persepolis. Meanwhile, Turin was also still setting events in motion for his plans, including appearing to a human named Jarel in Mian, setting him on his course to help the future emperor, Nolan. During the year that the next emperor, Nolan, would take the throne, we mostly saw Turin staying in the shadows, only once coming out to buy some bread for a beggar named Arvis. While Trilos decided to take over the body of a monk named Seymour and stay in the thick of the action with Zephyrin. And while at first glance the tale of Nolan seems to be another one where Trilos created chaos and Torin went and fixed it, but there was actually more at play. You see, Torin would have been able to foresee and therefore plan for Mwandalay's attempt to overthrow the Empire so there wasn't a huge probability of that actually succeeding. The significant moment came when at the very last minute, Trilos intervened by tricking Zephyrin into killing Nephron and therefore damning her soul from entering Pyre. That was a calculated move by Trilos, as while Turin knew that his foretelling was blind to Trilos and his actions, Trilos was not actually sure but had begun suspecting. And so, Trilos used this as a test. Perhaps Turin can't predict what I will do, 
Maybe he can only witness the effects of my actions after they occur. Like a blind spider, he might not be able to see me, and he only knows I'm nearby after feeling the vibration of the web as I move through it. That would be a very important piece of information to have at my disposal, and it should be easy to test such a hypothesis. If something had stopped Zephyrin, Trilos would have known that he was wrong and that Turin could foresee what he was going to do. But no one stopped her. And while Turin did remain disciplined and didn't interfere and expose himself, Trilos was still able to prove his theory correct and would bank that knowledge for future use later. Turin would appear to Zephyrin after the fact to apologize for his failings and the events he set in motion would still be enough to stop the attack on the Empire, keeping his plans intact. After Nolan took control of the Empire, Trilos left the story for a bit. While Turin continued with his planning, he kept tabs on the new Empire, as he seemed to be at each new Emperor's coronation, and in 1680, he had to fix a huge mistake he had made over 7,000 years earlier. When he originally created the Horn of Glendora to control the line of Frey succession, he didn't consider the Fane of the Frey having twins, as pure Frey never had twins. But that year, the heir of the Fane had a twin boy and girl, and Turin knew one of the twins would need to die in order for the Horn's powers to remain active and his plans remain viable. So that year, he used his foretelling to predict 10 prophecies to the Imperial family. Thereby, when the time came 200 years later, they would trust his words. In 1879, Turin went down to West Echo, where he both assisted Orantin Fallon in writing Eloquis, and he saved the village of Tour from invaders by creating magical weapons for them. The next year, we saw a lot of Turin, and while his main objective during this time was to lead Fairlane along the path she must go, which included saving the Empire from Wandalay once again, establishing the Sensler Guild, and eventually dying, we also saw a new side to Turin as he fell in love with Fairlane, which meant, at the end of the story, when Turin took Fairlane's life, meaning he would not be able to see her again as he is immortal, it meant that much more. Muriel also reacted to this, as this, the very thing he had done to her, splitting her from her true love for eternity, Turin had now done to himself for the good of the world. Muriel showered her father with feathers, but this time he ignored them. After Fairlane's death, Turin stayed busy at work. He still managed to stay close to the Imperial family, again attending all coronations. He also visited the artist Ruby in the Mystic Wood, telling her she will have to make a choice someday to kill Ezra Hodden or Mileva. He also acted as a deacon at the Ryanilian Seminary in order to set Jerish on his path to become a Teshlor Knight. Prior to Ezra Hodden coming to the capital city, Turin was in Persepolis acting as a court painter, while secretly advising the Emperor. Ironically, Trilos was also in Persepolis during this time, where he had taken on the name of Yolric, one of the most senior teachers at the Sensarium, the magical guild for humans. This led to the events in the book Ezra Hodden which culminated in what is most likely the most important moment in the whole trilos turin saga. Turin had already set up Ezra Hodden to inherit his cloak, which Ezra Hodden finally did, and Turin used this fact as a beacon to his brother. Trilos rightly realized that Turin was trying to make Ezra Hodden stand out to him, but Trilo still took the bait as he thought it was an opportunity for him to throw a wrench directly into Turin's plans. As it turned out though, this is exactly what Turin wanted as he used Trilos and Ezra Hadden's trip to point out several things to Trilos. Firstly, 
the cloak gave Ezrahaddon dreams, which were memories from Turin, giving Trilos more context to what was happening before and after his death. Perhaps the most important being that after Aluria died, the world started to die as well, turning from summer to winter. This was the moment Trilos finally realized something he had been missing. If Aluria was dead, how was there still life on the planet? Later, during the same trip, when Trilos spoke to Maleva, the full answer came to him, that Muriel, being the daughter of Aluria, must be what was keeping life going on Elan. And for the first time, he started to question whether he was correct about Turin being the invisible hand. Trilos decided that instead of messing up Turin's plan this time, he was going to let it play out. Maleva told Trilos that because of the special properties of Barapathin, Turin could actually see Trilos while he was there. While this may or may not have been true, it could have been that Turin was watching to see what Trilos would do with his newfound information. This is also where Trilos learnt about the true impact of chaos, and that Turin might not have been the first to invent evil, but was instead evil's first victim. Trilos returned to Persepolis and actively tried not to interfere so that any of Turin's plans could continue without interruption. He even assisted Ezra Hodden, believing that Turin would view his actions as an answer to an unspoken question as to whether the two should meet. Turin did appear briefly to Ezra Hodden, though Ezra didn't know who he was at the time. Turin gave him an apology and a final subtle hint about what he must do to the city of Persepolis. And as the culmination of the destruction of Persepolis occurred, Trilos did interfere one more time by helping Elinia escape the city. And that was when it happened. After over 8,000 years, the two brothers finally met again. The world, it seemed, also wanted to be dead. Or maybe it was just holding its breath waiting. Yes, she thought, that's exactly what it's like. It's as if the world herself is so caught up in suspense, so devastatingly excited that she can't contain it. Something huge is about to happen, and Elan is holding her breath in anticipation. I knew it, Yorick said, his voice hardly more than a whisper. At long last, he comes. She heard the Sensar Master stand up as someone approached. Elinia turned over and looked up to see a tall, thin man wearing a simple smock-style tunic and carrying a bag over one shoulder. The bag appeared to weigh next to nothing, and when the man brushed it with his swinging arm, it looked to be filled with something soft, like a pillow. Elinia, the stranger said, smiling at her as he approached, I'm so glad to see you're all right. I had hoped you would be. He glanced at Yorick. For so many reasons. Then the stranger faced Yorick, and the smile faded as the two studied each other. Hello, brother. We don't know anything more about what happened at that meeting, though whatever did happen certainly changed the future of Elan forever. So, let's just skip over to what occurred after. Trilos did not appear in any book written after that point in the timeline. So he was either acting in the shadows, away from the book plot lines, or perhaps he was no longer on Elan. Turin, on the other hand, was still busy crafting events to fit his plans. 800 years later, Turin would fulfill a promise he had made to Persephone thousands of years earlier, when he saved the newborn Royce and dropped him off at an orphanage. He would then make his way down to Calais to find a Tankin woman named Ilya, who was Gwen's mother, and tell her about her need to travel north. Years later, he would find Gwen in Vernes just after her mother had died, and give her hope and some gold. 
He would then travel over to the Manzant salt mines, where Royce was a prisoner. Going by the name Nim, Turin would help Royce and give him the magical blade Alverstone. This all helped set up the events of Rhaeyra, where Turin would play the role of Nimbus, where he helped the new empress as she struggled to run the new empire. While Turin would stay mostly under the radar during this time, in the last scene of the book, Royce realizes Turin is much more than he seems, and Turin is rewarded with another feather from Muriel. And for now, that is where the story ends. The story of Turin and Trilos is seriously one of my favorite aspects of the world of Alon, and trying to put it in a single video doesn't do it justice. This video is already way too long as it is. I did try to include any appearance or reference we get to either character throughout all the books, but let me know if I missed any. And also, let me know what you think happened at the top of the hill when they met. Uh, that's a story I really hope that we get someday. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Be sure to subscribe and watch my other videos to learn more about the world of Alon and Rhaeyra. Thanks!